Um, I'm very happy to uh, announce the next speaker. Actually, I will hand the word over to uh, my uh, co-organizer, Alex Yavoronko from In Silicon Medicine, who will introduce our next speaker. Alex. Wait a minute, you're muted. Just one second. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You're good. Thank you very much. Uh, great pleasure, uh, everybody, to uh, have you at uh, Aging Pharma um, uh, this year, so the seventh annual Aging uh, Research for Drug Discovery Conference. Uh, we are deeply honored uh, to be joined by Dr. Uh, Kai Fu Lee, uh, who is the chairman uh, and CEO of Sinovation Ventures. So he is dialing in from China today. Uh, and uh, as you can see, it's uh, uh, you know, China work ethic, uh, it's uh, uh, 9 p.m. and uh, there is uh, lots of work, I'm pretty sure, on his side uh, today. Uh, and he is joining us uh, um, with, with, with a very, very cool lecture. So Sinovation Ventures is, is probably the most prominent and the most uh, advanced uh, AI venture fund in the world. Uh, they currently uh, manage over $2 billion, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in assets, in capital, uh, investing in uh, some of the really top AI companies. So prior to founding Sinovation Ventures, uh, Dr. Kai Fu was the vice president of Google, Google um, uh, president of Google China. Uh, he also was uh, uh, one of the senior executives at Microsoft, CGI, and Apple, working with Steve Jobs. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree from uh, Columbia University in computer science and a PhD uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. So it's great that uh, this uh, conference is also organized uh, by Columbia University uh, in, uh, with, with the University of Copenhagen. Uh, so it's kind of alma mater. Uh, and he has honorary degrees from many, many universities, including the City University of Hong Kong and Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and uh, again, one of the most influential people in AI. Uh, it's deep, uh, Great, great honor to, to, to see you, Dr. Kaibu, here, uh, and uh, specifically talking about AI for longevity. I don't think uh, uh, a lot of people have thought about that deeply yet, so it's an emerging area. And off to you. Great pleasure to have you on the conference. Thank you. Thank you. I keep getting... Uh, thank you. It's a great honor and opportunity to uh, present at this um, prestigious conference. Uh, and uh, what I want to talk about is artificial intelligence, which is a field that I have worked in for the past 40 years, and uh, longevity, an area that I've just been introduced to in the recent years as I'm learning, working with deep longevity and in silicon medicine. So artificial intelligence, you're probably most familiar about that from science fiction, uh, thinking about how human equivalents are created um, in all sorts of ways, usually leading to either a utopian or dystopian outcome. Uh, that's what we call general AI. Certainly that is a grand challenge that all of us working in AI want to strive towards. But what is exciting today is that while we're still very far from getting general AI to work at all, we do have narrow AI or applied AI that is using AI to solve specific problems in specific domains that is reaching uh, breakthrough results in many, many areas. And I think longevity could be uh, the next big area. Uh, if you look at the history of AI research, there has been just one huge um, invention and breakthrough. It's called deep learning. Um, it was the ideas were there 30 years ago, but it was really made a big deal in the um, academia around eight or nine years ago and in the industry the last four to five years. And it's been um, breaking all kinds of records. Uh, the fundamental reason why deep learning works so well is that compared to previous approaches, uh, the original AI approach on the top row is just that people make up rules about if this happens, then I do that. If this happens, then I do that. But the systems that are built are very fragile. And then people came up with traditional learning methods, uh, methods like linear regression, methods like uh, SVM, and they were better, but they were still brittle. And it was really only with deep learning that allowed us to build these so-called deep neural networks that we see on the bottom 
that can project data into large dimensions. We're talking about 5,000 dimensions and create decision service surfaces that are learned from data. So when you have a, do a single domain in which you have a lot of data and the data has many much dimensionality and you know what the grand truth is, that is, this is a cat, that is a dog, or this is someone who um, is a good borrower, and this is someone who defaults on loans, um, the system can teach itself, not at all using human anatomical suggestions, but brand um, new uh, statistical techniques that are based on deep learning that does gradient descent to do um, near optimal separation of these uh, uh, segments. So deep learning works extremely well when you have a domain in which you have a lot of data and you know the grand truth and you optimize for some objective function. So what it, what's really great about deep learning is that first you pick an objective function. Let's say if you're a business, make the most money. If you're Facebook, the most hours that people will spend on your, on your website. If you're an investment firm, highest return on investment. So, and then just throw all the data in and the, the algorithm goes to work for you. So it's an omni-use technology that spans all kinds of areas. Uh, the second great thing about uh, deep learning is that it scales with processing. So the more power of computing you have and the more data you have, the better it performs. So you can start with the same problem definition, collect some data, use some computers, get some results, then all you have to do is collect more data, throw more computing, and it just keeps getting better. Obviously, you, you would want an AI scientist to tweak things a bit, but uh, generally it scales. And that's why it has beaten every other approach because it's fundamentally based on Moore's law and its extensions as it applies to GPU and large amounts of data. The third is that you can do targeted optimization. So each person can get a different experience. When I go to Amazon, I see a different page than you do. Just like when we go into medical uh, in the future, I would get a different diagnosis than you do because something about my history. Um, and I would potentially get a different longevity advice than you would because you and I are different. Uh, traditional medicine tends to treat people in clusters, if not all the same, because medical students can only remember so much, but AI, deep learning can remember infinitely. And then lastly, you can throw in all kinds of data features. Uh, you can throw in people's age, uh, their photos, their medical imaging, their uh, temperature, uh, their disease, their family history, uh, everything, just throw it all in. And the system will decide what it will use that optimizes the objective function. You don't have to second guess deep learning and tell it, oh, I think for longevity is really important to measure NAD levels. Well, it will figure that out by itself you just, if you just throw in NAD levels as one of the, uh, the key features. Um, so AI uh, has essentially uh, made a huge difference in all kinds of areas, from internet to business, to perception, to autonomous robots, autonomous vehicles. And underneath each wave, you see the kinds of industries that it is creating value or disrupting. So it is effectively hitting 95% uh, plus of all industries on earth. And as Sinovation Ventures, we invest in AI. These are many, many of the areas we invest in. You'll see some AI medical examples on the bottom, but you can, you can really see this is an omni-use technology that will disrupt everything in the world and PwC and McKinsey estimates this will create about $15 trillion of incremental um, GDP in the next nine years. So we're really at the cusp of a breakthrough, AI powering everything. And of course, what more exciting uh, thing and, uh, than healthcare? I really see healthcare as a huge example. And in this picture, we can see that AI can be hitting every aspect of, of healthcare. Uh, we can start with um, uh, biomarker development, uh, going into uh, uh, protein design, uh, basically, and, uh, and, uh, and um, um, drug discovery, uh, going forward into precision medicine. Uh, particularly good fit for, for precision medicine. You can imagine our DNA being fed in 
so that each person with a different DNA may get a different advice or treatment. So these are all the many, many ways in which AI can potentially disrupt and improve healthcare. However, I also recognize as we made some investments in healthcare, uh, AI in healthcare is exciting, it's huge, but it's also very difficult because our lives and our health is at stake. And there are many traditional ways of doing things. So, so explaining to MD PhDs about why uh, AI in its own black box can do magic. And that could very well seem very scary to people who've sworn the Hippocrates oath uh, that a black box is treating people now. How do you explain yourself? So there are some natural difficulties of AI adoption in healthcare. I'm sure that will be overcome over time, uh, certainly as hum it's a perfect area for human uh, AI symbiosis, where the human does the creativity, the analysis, the diagnosis, and AI starts being a tool assisting the human. But it will be a long path because what is at stake? So great upside, but challenges. However, I see longevity a little bit differently because longevity is a new area. Um, it is not an area that has condensed thousands of years of, um, of um, uh, history about how to, um, how to um, get better performance, right? In medicine, cancer treatment, treatment of heart disease, there are lots of history built up and one would tend to follow that and some black box AI comes in and says, this is a great engineering trick that can teach, can teach you a better way to diagnose cancer uh, or uh, treat heart disease. People are likely to be skeptical and they want proof and they want explainability. So it's a bit challenging. And longevity being a new area, all of you, all of us are still learning about longevity, about how it might be treatable as a disease, about how it might be slowed, uh, how aging might, be slow down or potentially reversed it's an incredibly aid of and if we think about longevity there's uh, it fits all the strengths of deep learning that i talked about uh, we are collecting uh, large amounts of uh, of data on the left side we see that um, there's some genome um, and uh, lots of other things imaging etc being collected and um, in fact, age is a universal feature that's present in all of these data sets. So one could imagine on this um, training uh, neural network you see on the bottom, using age as something you train for, using all of the data types to predict age and using your biological age as a key feature. And with that, if you have longitudinal data, you can infer causality, uh, form new hypotheses, make progress on, um, on uh, uh, longevity research and AI can identify a lot of features that relate to diseases or versus aging. So one could imagine that uh, this is kind of the graph that I think can use AI, use deep learning uh, to advance and improve and understand uh, how, how we age. And one of the very variants, uh, so the deep learning I talked about is training with grand truth. What if we don't have grand truth? Well, there's a technology called reinforcement learning uh, that is quite effective in specific areas. Uh, you can actually learn from experience and uh, it requires an environment that auto-generates rewards. So you don't have the grand truth, but if you know how to reward the system, so it will do more of something you like, less of something you don't like, that's, um, that would be a way to, to, uh, to build reinforcement learning systems. And it's also that technology is a great fit with, uh, with uh, uh, generative uh, longevity uh, research. For example, in generative chemistry, we can set specific rewards so that the gener generative system learns the generation strategy to achieve uh, these rewards. For example, the rewards can be some molecular properties that we want the molecules to have, for example, solubility, bioavailability, and so on. And then the exact same strategy can be employed when generating biological data. For example, we can train on gene expression data coming from large longitudinal data sets with uh, age of the, pa uh, the patient, uh, disease, disease status, race, sex, um, um, 
whether they smoke or not, et cetera. So there's a tremendous way to apply AI uh, through generative chemistry and biology uh, to help uh, the longevity research. Another interesting technology is called transfer learning. Um, while um, reinforcement learning targets the problem of what if we don't have the grand truth, how do we train AI? Transfer learning tackles the problem of what if we don't have enough data? We know that AI works better with a lot of data. What we, if we don't have a lot of data? Well, in that case, transfer learning can first learn from a huge data set that solves one problem. And then you keep that network intact and use it to bootstrap a new training on a new problem on which you have less data. And it turns out, as long as the two problems are similar, transfer learning can take all the learning from a big data set to, into one with a smaller data set. So that again, has interesting uh, ramifications in, uh, for example, uh, predicting in longevity and health. For example, in this picture, if we first trained the, with the green node, that is you take all the data from all the people to train for their age, that is, I take all the genome behavior, uh, EEG, ECG, pictures, videos, everything, and say, guess how old this person is. And, and, and that uh, prediction of the age, uh, age is something everybody has. So you can train the network, train, oh, these people with these inputs have a, a particular lung disease, or they have follicular lymphoma or they have some other kind of disease. Of course, not everybody has every disease, but once you trained everyone for age, that can be the network that you bootstrap, and then you do transfer learning on specific uh, illnesses. So that can be very valuable uh, to build up um, a knowledge base, um, a, a network about people's um, health. And once we have that network, you can potentially use explainable learning to go back and look at your network uh, to, uh, to understand what features that actually made the prediction. If I predicted someone to be eight years older than their chronological age, what caused that? If I predict someone who doesn't yet have a heart disease, that they will have heart disease, what causes that? So that allows us to uh, understand the features, the selection, and uh, we can actually uh, essentially open up the black box and try to explain based on the numbers in the neural network uh, to see what caused aging. Um, and of course, if we're studying longevity and aging, we want a what's called a deep aging clocks. What they do is predict biological age. So we can uh, take a, a lot of data. Uh, data could be based on photos. You can predict age from photos, right? That's of course not based on very scientific, but you can predict um, uh, basically uh, age based on uh, uh, hemat hematological um, uh, data, uh, just draw blood and then use the, the, the numbers to pre predict how old someone is. I recently just did that. You can also do it from microbiome. You might ask, why do we want so many different clocks? Well, not everybody has every data type. So one could use the data types one has to do the best we can for predicting. And then of course we want to aggregate them again using training on a lot of people and also aggregating them together. So we could, it's kind of like if you have a car, you could have an engine that has an um, age of, um, it has two more years to live, but maybe your carburetor has 10 more years to live and put it all together, you can predict the age of the car. So it's a similar idea that one could, could do based on these individual um, aging clocks. Uh, one could apply this kind of aging clock in many ways. The most straightforward is just to pull them all together to predict uh, not the chronological age, but the biological age. So here you see uh, someone who has a, a chronological age of 52, but a biological age of 58. That means um, not good in terms of longevity. And, and then it will come back with suggestions on what can be done to make the biological clock less, given the biological clock was built from the individual clocks and the individual clocks are built from the features of each individual. We see that these kind of deep aging clocks are showing very good engineering and preliminary results. Uh, we're seeing uh, very, the, the various types of work that could be done once you do deep aging clocks to look at how to slow and reverse aging, um, how to educate and evolve, uh, how to do different types of analysis, how to do di diagnostics based on longitudinal data. Uh, we are seeing the work that uh, we're partnering with 
uh, uh, deep longevity and with um, in silico medicine. And this is one of the papers um, we help them um, de develop that tries to develop deep aging clocks and deep biomarkers uh, as predictors of biological age using deep learning techniques. So deep aging clocks can be applied in preventive medicine, drug discovery, uh, life insurance, health insurance, and many other industries. It is really an amazing and exciting uh, new technology, uh, but we kind of see it as a first step. And um, I'm also very excited to become a user of a website called young.ai. And this has been developed again by um, uh, Deep Longevity, basically connects the age metric and it connects with all the data I feed in with all of my tests. But one could see with wearable computing, it can track all the things I do and give me instantaneous feedback on things I shouldn't be, should or shouldn't be doing, things I shouldn't be eating, the not, not exercising enough, not exercising right, that can essentially become my AI doctor uh, with the goal of helping me live longer. That's something um, I think we should, all should want. So in conclusion today, hopefully if I, I've explained the excitement of AI making a huge difference to the world and looking at longevity as one of the most exciting applications because AI wants an objective function that is help us live longer. Um, and helping us live longer is a specific quantifiable numeric um, uh, goal that we all have as humans. So it connects our need as humans with the capability of AI, and also without a lot of baggage, because uh, frankly, longevity is a brand new, lots of new things are being tried. And I think AI provides the most exciting and proven toolkit that can help carry all the research forward. And I look forward to seeing AI researchers and longevity researchers working together to help us live longer and healthier. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Lee. That's, uh, um, uh, you know, I've been uh, working on longevity for 16 years now, and uh, I could not give uh, a lecture like that uh, uh, from, 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 from my vantage point. It's, uh, it's really beautiful. Thank you for this inspiration. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, we'll be able to also see the emergence of this kind of research in China. And uh, maybe, uh, Morton, if, if, if you can facilitate for Q&A, that would be uh, phenomenal. Yes. Thank sure. you very much, Dr. Lee. It was a, really a fantastic uh, talk, very, very thought-provoking. We have a number of questions uh, uh, on the Slack channel. Um, the most upvoted uh, one is, what do you think is the biggest breakthrough AI has made in longevity research in recent years? Um, actually, AI is just recently being tested in the area of longevity research. So I don't think we can claim any huge breakthroughs yet. Uh, but the example I gave, I think I'm most excited, uh, is this um, um, AI-driven, deep learning-driven biological clock. Because AI is so good at optimizing for an objective function, and longevity is about extending our age. So if we can learn to do things and be taught by AI to do things so that it will keep predicting us at a younger age than we are and keep predicting that we will live longer than we think we will, that seems to connect uh, the very goal and the essence of longevity with the technology that's uh, possible in AI. Yes, I agree, very, very nice. Um, we have maybe um, one more question, this is a, quite lengthy question, so forgive me, um, but I will just read it uh, out here. It's maybe a two-part question, but uh, Kai-Fu, as you mentioned, this is from uh, Max Unfried, by the way. The previous question was from Dmitry Kriokov. So Max Unfried ask, uh, asks uh, Kai-Fu, as you mentioned, AI, especially deep learning, is data hungry. How do you look at biomedical data acquisition? First, at privacy as its personal data, and second, at the large monetary cost to get big enough data sets to analyze the complexity of genomic, proteomic, transcriptomics data over different genders and ethnicities. Uh, yes, uh, that's a great question. And it's a problem that we as an, um, a group of researchers have to, have to solve together. Because without the large amounts of data, AI will not function. So the, the first, I think, 
uh, there is clearly a privacy issue. So we need to go through fully anonymization of the data so that we can have data sets that cannot be uh, reverse engineered or pseudo, it's not, not pseudo anonymized, but fully anonymized. And I think countries should work together and health organizations work together to aggregate these databases to enable researchers everywhere to use them. I think that's the, the first thing. The other is uh, corporations will have to use the data too. And sometimes um, uh, large amounts of data needs to become available in, in ways that a corporation requires. So, uh, and, and also a lot of the data is collected on the fly. So in the app I just talked about, Young.ai is collected my data right now, how do I anonymize it uh, on my phone? You can't. So I think there needs to be new technologies that allow us to have our cake and eat it too. So one technology called federated learning allows the uh, AI training to be run on my phone. And then when I submit to young.ai, I may not be submitting what I ate this morning or what I did last night, but rather the models that's trained that can be aggregated at young.ai. It's huh. not yet at that stage, but I think in the future, we want the training, the privacy data to be, to be only used uh, either at my, the device that I own or in the hospital or with the medical care provider to whom I've licensed the use of my data so that the data, my data, personal data doesn't get all over the world. That sounds really exciting. Sincerely yeah. appreciate Kai Fu's uh, uh, contribution to our conference. Really, really appreciate it. Just FYI, Dr. Kaifu has, uh, I think, uh, uh, 60 million followers on WeChat. So, yeah, last time we did a, uh, an AI for drug discovery lecture together, it, it had 10 million views in 48 hours. <laughs> so, that's very um, nice. Dr. Kaifu is a giant in his field. So, yeah. I, I'm really thankful and I really hope that uh, we see this lecture in China because that's, uh, that might change the course of history. Thank you more yes. than for, 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 for Thank you, Alex.